hope you had a good weekend. Um, we do have homework due tomorrow. I think I didn't put it in great scope yet, but uh, sorry about that. Um, we are talking about subsequences. That's what we started talking about last time. Subsequences have kind of a technical definition to them, but really it's, it's not that complicated. It's just a, um, a, uh, a bunch of numbers that are taken from the original sequence. You have to take infinitely many of them. Um, and they have to be in the same order of the original sequence. So if I had something like um, a n is maybe uh, 2, 4, 6, 8, etc., then I could make a subsequence. Usually we write them with two subscripts. Like, um, how about I can choose only the multiples of 4? This is a subsequence. You have to take terms from the original sequence taken in the same order. You don't repeat them or anything like that unless they were repeated in the original sequence. Um, and you have to take infinitely many so that what you get is, is another sequence. That's what a typical subsequence looks like. And I wrote at the end last time a theorem about subsequences which um, this theorem, I, I thought you might be interested to know, also appears as um, this was the uh, comprehensive exam in 2022, this year or last year, however you want to say it. Um, last year's uh, comprehensive exam, the real analysis section, you know about the comprehensive exam, it has a bunch of different sections. One of them is devoted to real analysis and you must answer um, questions from each section. You have some amount of choice about which ones you want to do. But anyway, um, one of the questions this was, I, I looked this up, this was number 22, part D, for two points. Um, it said, uh, prove that if some sequence Xn converges to X, then all subsequences of Xn converge to X. All right. This was your job on uh, for this problem. So I thought we should let's try and do this one. Actually, this is a very important theorem, and I wrote the statement of this theorem last time. If a sequence converges then all subsequences of that sequence also converge to the same thing, right? If xn goes, converges to x, then all subsequences converge to x. Uh, if they make you do it on the comprehensive exam, it can't be all that hard, I guess. Like the, the questions, I would say the comprehensive exam questions are not meant to be hard individually. What makes it hard is just that you have to remember everything because you, you have to be able to do all, all the different sections. That's what makes the exam hard. Not, um, but the individual questions are not really meant to be super hard by themselves. But anyway, let's see, let's see if we can do this. Um, just between us, I would have done this proof even if it wasn't on the comp, but it was on the comp, so I thought maybe that you would be interested in that. But this is an important thing by itself, whether it's on the exam or not. Um, all subsequence also converge to X. Uh, there are many ways that you could do this, but I'm going to try and do this sort of thinking of it uh, topologically speaking. So I'll say let epsilon greater than zero be given. And I'm going to think of this in terms of neighborhoods. Then we'll show, or we'll find N, just because sometimes I don't want to make those inequalities with the absolute values such that um, n greater than the big N implies uh, x. So what am I doing here? Sorry, I, I should have started with some different words. I have to prove that all subsequences converge to x. So what I meant to say at the very beginning, let x n k be a subsequence. And then we're going to show that that converges to x. Sorry, can you squeeze that in? Let x n k be a subsequence. And then we'll show that x and k converge to x, right? Sorry, 
I left that out. That's the setup. You have to show that all subsequences converge to epsilon. All right, so we start with the subsequence. Um, let epsilon greater than zero be given. We'll find n, sorry, I, rather than a little n right here, I'm going to call it a k. And I'm going to use the neighborhood version of this. Why I call it k is because my subsequence is x n k, where you know the terms of my sequence are x n one, x n two, x n three. The variable for what goes down there is k, rather than usually it's n, but I, I'm using k this time because it's a k this time. All right. Anyway, what this means is you know our our limit point is x, and we have some small neighborhood around x. This is x plus epsilon, this is x minus epsilon. And we have to show that eventually all the points from the subsequence lie in here. All right? Yes? Let x and k be a subsequence. Yeah. Now it looks weird. All right. We have to show that eventually all the terms from the subsequence land in here. Uh, if you're thinking properly about this, I mean, in just in an ordinary using ordinary words, it seems like that. Anybody feel like that's true? Is it true that all the terms of the subsequence eventually land in here? Um, remember what we have assumed. We have assumed that the entire sequence itself converges to x, right? So that means if I look at all the terms in the whole sequence. They converge to x. That means actually, when I look at all the terms in the whole sequence, they all end up in here eventually. Is it also true that the subsequence also ends up in there eventually? Yeah, it would have to be true because the subsequence is just taken from the original sequence. All right, so what I'm going to say is something about since the whole sequence eventually ends up in here, I'll say maybe we know there exists some big N such that. Um, n greater than big N implies xn is in the neighborhood, right? We know there is some point, the big N, such that all the terms from the original sequence land in that little neighborhood. Now, does that also mean that all the terms in the subsequence from that point on are going to land in the neighborhood? I think it, it does actually. This, this directly means that if I take k bigger than the same n, if k is greater than n, then x and k, can I say x and k is further along in the sequence? than x big N, right? The fact that the x ends converge to x means there's some big N so that all the ones after that go in here. But actually, if you're only looking at a subsequence, those ones in their list, they get there even faster because the subsequence is skipping out on certain values, right? The subsequence is only taking some of them. So that if I use the same big N in the subsequence, this uh, subsequence term is further along in the sequence than this one, and what that means is, so x and k is also in the neighborhood. It's because the subsequence is doing the same thing, only faster, because you're skipping out on certain values. So the original sequence reaches the neighborhood after big N, it means also the same big N um, the uh, subsequence will definitely be in the neighborhood when it gets to the same big N. All right. This is one way that you could argue this. Any thoughts about that? It's a little confusing, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, not, it doesn't quite. It doesn't mean that all of them are in here. It just means beyond a certain point, they're all in here. But it, it, it's true. Like, since um, beyond this point, 
all of them are in there. So it means that beyond that same point, all the ones in the subsequence are, are in there. You might worry if maybe the subsequence uses some of the earlier ones later or something, but the fact is the subsequence terms, they are always, uh, this is why I said this, this kind of thing. Term K in the subsequence is further along than, uh, than term M from the original one. So it's, um, you don't have to worry about getting some earlier values uh, later in the subsequence. All right. So this anyway is an important uh, is an important theorem. If a sequence converges, then all subsequences of that same sequence also converge to the same value. All right. This is super important about subsequences. Um, I would like to mention something about the contrapositives of this. So can I? I'm just going to write that theorem again, just because it's important. If x n converges to x and x n k is the subsequence. then x and k also converges to x, right? Um, this actually is a cute way that you can show something does not converge in the contrapositive of this. So remember the contrapositive would be I negate the, uh, I, you negate, if it's like p implies q, the contrapositive is not q implies not p. And they are equivalent. So the contrapositive you just get for free. If, if you already know this is true, the contrapositive is automatically true. That means the contrapositive would mean if there's a subsequence which does not converge to x, then the original sequence also does not converge to x. All right. Uh, now that that precisely is not what I'm going to write here, but I'm going to say there's actually two versions of some contrapositives that are useful in this case. First of all, if any subsequence <coughs> x and k diverges, then x n also diverges. Right? Because if x n converges, that means all the subsequences also converge. So if one of them doesn't converge, one of the subsequences diverges, it means that the original sequence automatically diverges. Um, and this is often a, uh, a convenient way to show that... Uh, uh, sorry, actually, I'm going to say another one which is more useful. So that's, that's one. Another is not only that if something diverges, but it says here, the theorem says that all the subsequences have the same limit, right? They all converge to x, the same thing. What that means is if you have two different subsequences that converge to two different things, then the original sequence must have diverged. So that's the other contrapositive. If um, we have two subsequences, with different limits then xn diverges right because when xn converges all the subsequences have the same limit so if you ever see two subsequences with two different limits it means that the whole thing must not have converged in the first place the whole sequence diverges all right. Uh, this second one is actually uh, super useful for showing that things diverge. You know, we, we, we did one example of showing th something diverged by doing some weird negation of, the, of all the quantifiers. That's kind of a pain to do, but this actually is fairly simple. Actually, that, that same example, remember? For example, it was this. This diverges. How could you argue that? Actually, we can do this without using the epsilons or anything. All we have to do is, uh, by, the, by the thing that I wrote up there, if we have two sequences with different limits, two subsequences with different limits, then xn diverges. Of course, this sequence is um, minus 1, 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1, 1. All right. Uh, to show it diverges, I'll find two subsequences with different limits. Anyone want to suggest? 
two subsequences of that which have different limits yeah yeah the odds and the even so if I take just the odd ones I get minus one minus one minus one and this what's the limit of that minus one yeah and if I just take the evens it's one 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 and this one the limit is one so I have two subsequences with different limits that means the overall sequence does not converge and that's all there is to it these are different so that means that uh, my original sequence minus one to the n diverges right this if you ask me is like one of the typical ways that I would show some some sequence diverges this is this is like my go-to um, find some subsequences with different limits or you could find here a subsequence which diverges that shows that the entire sequence diverges here here's another similar example actually this example also I got off of an old comprehensive exam how about this show that this diverges n sine n times sine of uh, pi n over 2 how you like that this diverges hmm um, yeah, you have an idea? Yeah. yeah, let's let's just try and think about what these terms look like. Like apart from the n at the beginning, what does this look like? Um, he said it goes from between minus one and one. Actually, when you start n is one, I get sine of pi over two, which is one, right? And then when n is two, I get sine of pi, which is zero. Yeah. So this this part, just this part, goes one. 0. What's next? 3 pi over 2 would be negative 1. And then it's going to be 4 pi over 2, which is 2 pi, which gives you 0 for the sign. So this part of it does this. It's like he said, it's, it's 1 and minus 1, but it, it has zeros in between also. Minus 1, 0, etc. All right. That's just this much. And then you're multiplying each time by n. So actually, this sequence it's going to look like um, you take these and you, you multiply each time by n's which go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 so really what you get is 1, 0, minus 3, 0, 5, 0, minus 7, 0, etc. I think that's what the terms look like. It's a little strange but... All right. Mm -hmm. Show that this diverges. Can you see a um, a subsequence which you can which definitely diverges? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe if I consider all the negatives, I was going to consider only the positives, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter, I suppose. Um, all the negatives. Yeah. What even What even are they? The next The next number would be nine, right? I think if I take just all the positives, it's 1 and then 5 and then 9. It'll inc increase by 4 every time, right? Just because of the way the sign sort of cycles between four values. This is a subsequence. Which uh, diverges. That's because it's unbounded, right? And every, uh, because these values, they increase like to infinity and every um, every unbounded sequence automatically diverges that's because we had a theorem that said if uh, if the sequence converges then it's bounded the contrapositive would be if it's unbounded then it diverges so this is a subsequence which diverges that's because it's unbounded so the original sequence also diverges Right. Yes. So you could say that it's like 
I could say this is unbounded. Yeah, I mean, this is always a, a, a little game that you can play on the comp. Is what are you, what are you allowed to get away with saying saying things that are obvious? Um, I would say you can say this is unbounded. To me, that's obvious enough. I mean, if you if you really want to if you really want to get into it, you could say here's a formula for this. It's, isn't it one plus four n? Um, that's if n starts at zero. I guess if n starts at one, it would be four n minus three. And that's definitely unbounded. As n goes to infinity, that goes to infinity. Although I, I wouldn't say you need to say that. Yeah, some you can um, to some extent you can get away with things on on the comp by stating things confidently are obvious. And they might believe you if, if you know. This is what I when I'm grading tests is the worst thing when somebody says something as if it was obvious. And I find myself wondering, is that person, is that person smart enough to know why that's true and they just <laughs> didn't want to write it? Or do they not know why it's true? I don't like trying to judge your, uh, your motivations when I'm reading the text. But anyway, yeah, I, I would say this is obviously unbounded. That's, maybe that's my opinion. I got away with that when I was in grad school. We had to take uh, big uh, exams. And this was actually on the real analysis exam. I had, there was one question where the, the problem was the test was written by the guy who taught my real analysis class and the problem on the test was something that I did not know how to do at all but I remembered that that problem, he did it as an example in class on the day that we talked about something called the radon nicotine theorem, and I don't remember what the radon nicotine theorem is now. And then I didn't, but I remembered it was on the same day, and so I just wrote on the test, this is true by the radon nicotine theorem. <laughs> That's all I wrote, and I got full credit. So, <laughs> I fooled him. It is possible. Maybe the maybe that guy like had some kind of respect for me and real and decided, yeah, he probably knows what he's talking about. And I, I betrayed that respect because I definitely did not know what I was talking about. All right, um, this is all about subsequences, right? One, uh, I, I found another comp problem about this, which I thought we should, we should try out. Uh, I don't know if you like doing these comprehensive problems. Actually, this one is, strikes me as being kind of hard. So if you feel like this one is kind of hard, then this is number 22E on the same test. It said, prove that if xn is increasing and has a convergent subsequence, then xn converges. All right, if xn is increasing and has a convergent subsequence, then xn converges. Maybe I'm just doing it wrong. I, I, I kind of felt like this was, a, this was a little hard, harder than that other one. Um, when I look at this, I see increasing and I'm trying to show that it converges. This makes me think of the monotone convergence theorem, which is what we talked about last week which was, if it's monotone, that is to say either increasing or decreasing, and bounded, then it converges, all right? Now, I'm given that it's increasing here. I have to conclude that it converges. So maybe we could show that it's also bounded, and then that automatically means that it converges. Um, is it uh, going to be also bounded? Well, I feel like if it has a convergent subsequence, all, this is just my thoughts before actually trying to write the proof. If it has a convergent subsequence, that means there are some parts of the sequence which actually converge to a certain point, x, right? But that's not all of them. There may be other terms in the sequence. But those other ones, because the sequence is increasing, the other ones, they have to be like in between these ones, right? They can't, 
for instance, be all the way over here. Because the sequence is increasing from one term to the next, it just moves to the right every time, all right? So the kind of the left out, left out, the values that were left out, they need to be in between these other ones, all right? And so actually, according to this picture, like it really should be bounded. So, so maybe it'll work to, uh, to, to show that this sequence is bounded. So anyway, that's, that's gonna be my strategy. So here's my proof. I'm going to say, um, we'll show that xn is bounded. And then since it's increasing, the monotone convergence theorem will imply that it converges. Right? MCT means the monotone convergence theorem. Does that mean that the reverse is not true? Like how we said that um, if a sequence converges in this particular convergence, then like this is the opposite for like the convergence subsequence. That's right. Yeah, it is possible to have a convergence subsequence even if the whole thing diverges. Like that actually happens here. Every other term is a zero. So those ones, those ones converge. Even though the, the whole series, the whole sequence as a whole diverges. Yeah. Well, that's what that's that's what we want to show. I think. Say that again. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So actually, it doesn't even matter. The increasing part for that doesn't matter. Any any convergent sequence is automatically bounded. Yeah. yeah. No, actually, all just zeros. Oh, that is not monotone, but some things which are not monotone can still converge. Yeah, like they can be, they can, for instance, alternate signs, but <coughs> approach zero from both, you know, that, that is possible. Yeah, that's a good idea. That's like the converse of the monotone convergence, which is not true. Um, yeah, so actually I'm gonna say um, what, what she just said, that is, we know that the subsequence converges, which means the subsequence is bounded, right? And in fact, we can say it's bounded because it's increasing, it's bounded by x, right? The, uh, the limit is actually bigger than all of the uh, terms that perhaps equal. So I'm gonna say since x and k converges, let's say to x, I mean, I, I, I made up that, that letter x, but x is, I'm going to say, x is the, the limit of that sequence. Since x and k converges to x, um, x and k is bounded. And since it's increasing, the thing that it's converging to, it's like increasing up to x, right? It's not like it converges in some other way. So x and k is bounded, and in fact, since it's increasing, um, x and k is actually bounded by x, right? That is, x is actually bigger than those terms. All right, I'm feeling all right about this. Then why does that mean, remember what we're trying to show is that the entire sequence, all the other stuff, is also bounded. I think actually it's also bounded by x, right? Every, everything here should be less than x. So um, anyone feel like, can you explain why the other terms also are less than x? Because then that'll do it. We have to show that everything is bounded by x. Yeah? Yeah, I, I would say, like, if you think of these, these, say these red ones are the subsequence and the black ones are the original sequence, yeah. 
every one of the black ones is less than one of the red ones. I think that's what you're saying, right? Yeah. Each, each of the xn's is less than one of the terms in the subsequence. Yeah, so this is what I would say. Since, um, since xn is increasing, each xn is um, less or equal to some x and k. Each of the original terms in the original sequence is less than or equal to one of the terms in the subsequence because the subsequence uses infinitely many terms taken from further and further down the list. And so I can sort of writing that with an inequality sign. So xn is less than or equal to x and k. But we already said that is less than x. Really, this less than should have been a less or equal. Sorry. This they could. It's possible they could all equal x. That's not very interesting, but it is in theory possible. Yes. So why can't you assume that the sequence is less than x, not greater? Um. Like why do we know that every? Yeah. It's it's because uh, we assume that xn is increasing, so each each value is less than the next one, and. Uh, that means that if we're if we're looking at one um, like th this one cannot be bigger than uh, all the other ones. There there is there is an element of the subsequence which is which is greater than this one. I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but as you go deeper and deeper into the sequence, it just gets bigger every time. Um, all right. Anyway, that, that right there, if you ignore the middle, it says xn is less than or equal to x. So the xn sequence is bounded. And that's what we wanted to demonstrate. Right? So xn is bounded. Bonded. As desired, right? I said at the very beginning that is what we were going to demonstrate. All right, that one I would say is, is a little tricky. Um, I can't remember how many people actually tried to do that question on the conference. Your typical section will have like four questions and you get to choose which one you like the looks of. And so, um, you know, you think something looks hard, you just don't do it. Do the easy one. That's the, that's the, the winning strategy. All right. Um, we got 15 minutes left. I think that's enough time to talk about one of my favorite theorems in real analysis. And this is, um, I think, the second like named theorem on the in the syllabus. Uh, it's a big deal. We'll talk. Uh, we'll we'll do some talk about it today, and then maybe we'll talk some more about it next time. Uh, this is called the. It's also about subsequences. It's called the bolzano weierstrass theorem. If you remember my little history lesson on the first day, Bolzano was the, um, at least as far as I know, the first person to come up with the epsilon and n definition of convergence of a sequence. Uh, and when Bolzano worked that out, really nobody cared about it at that point. Um, sorry, I left out a, just another E in Weierstrass right there. I, I left that one out. Um, Weierstrass is the one who came up with those definitions again, but Weierstrass uh, was influential enough that everybody really cared about it. So Bolzano and Weierstrass, I, I'm not sure they were even alive at the same time. They didn't work on this together, but they each came up with this, and now it's just kind of named after both of them, even though they didn't know each other. It's about subsequences. It says if a n is bounded, I wrote a n for some reason, even though I've been using x n the rest of uh, today. That's all right. Um, if a n is bounded, then it's about subsequences. Now, if you have a bounded thing, it does not necessarily converge, right? Because it could just oscillate or something like that. But think about the subsequences of that thing. Um, if the original sequence is bounded, 
The subsequences also might oscillate, but you could perhaps also choose the subsequences so that they never oscillate. Actually, the, the conclusion here, it's not obvious that this is really true, but if a n is bounded, then there is a convergent subsequence. This is the Balzano Weierstrass theorem. Right. What does it look like? I'm, I'm going to try and um, draw a little. What if I sort of drew a graph of a sequence? Like here's a, maybe a1 is 0, a2 is 3. You know, the, the values, they, they just kind of bounce around, right? I'm trying to draw the graph of a sequence. And imagine that that sequence is bounded. That means the values never go above there and they never go below there, right? Bounded bounded in absolute value, all right? So these points, they just, I'm, I'm not drawing any kind of pattern to them, but they just sort of bounce around in there, all right? Now, this sequence that I drew definitely doesn't seem to converge, right? These, these values are not getting close to anything as we go. But the balzano weierstrass theorem says, if it's bounded, then automatically there is a subsequence that converges. Can you see a subsequence that, that seems to actually converge to some value here? Well, I mean, I kind of can. Like, how about if I choose just these guys? Then they, it looks like those, they kind of do approach a, a value. And I just did this at random, like I didn't plan that out, right? Um, if your original sequence is bounded, forever bouncing in between these two values, then, the balzano weierstrass theorem says it's actually always possible to find some guys that sort of magically line up and end up converging. All right, it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting thing in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. If it just oscillates between two points, then it would look like this. Can you find a subsequence that converges? That's what the theorem says. I think I can, like this, converges, right? Yeah, that's kind of stupid, but yeah. Yeah, it is always, I mean, it's a true theorem, so it is always possible. If, a, if your sequence is bounded, then it has a convergent subsequence. I wanna try and explain why this is true. Actually, you should check out, I don't, we don't need to, to do it right now, but you should check out on YouTube, you can search for this. Bolzano Weierstrauss graph. It's true. Check it out. There is a um, a certain friend of mine, um, Professor Steve Sawin. I don't know if you know him. He's currently the chair of the uh, department here at the university, the math department. Um, he uh, had a brief career as a mathematical rapper. Um, Check it out, the balzano weierstrass rap. It's a uh, it's the proof of the balzano weierstrass theorem in uh, in rap form, with some um, with some woefully untalented background singers. <laughs> you got to check it out. Yeah, Steve, um, I would say he uh, he lacks what the rappers call flow, but uh, you, you can be the judge of that. <laughs> um, this is actually the first thing when I. Um, when I applied for the job at Fairfield University, I didn't really know anything about Fairfield. This is the first thing that I saw <laughs> related to the Fairfield University math department was Steve's, uh, Steve's Bolzano Weierstrass rap. Uh, anyway, his proof actually, the, the proof in the rap is different from what I wanted to do, but what I, you know, we can, we can do this in, in our 10 minutes. So I would like to prove the uh, Bolzano Weierstrass using the, um, my proof is based on the nested interval property. I believe Steve's proof uses the monotone convergence theorem, but uh, check it out. You should watch Steve's original version, um, but then there's also, uh, there's like an annotated version. Somebody took his original thing and basically cut out his, uh, the video of him, but, but made some like diagrams of what he's describing. The original video is like just, yeah, it's just him uh, spitting lyrics. 
Um, but it's hard to, you can kind of follow what he's saying, but it's hard to, it's hard to follow the proof really. But uh, the annotated version has helpful diagrams as it goes. Anyway, um, our proof will use the nested intervals property, which is, it's a different proof from, from Steve's. Um, so here's the idea. I'm going to draw a picture to give us the idea. Um, our sequence is bounded. That means the entire sequence lives in this universe between m and minus m for some upper bound and, and some lower bound, right? And the sequence exists, you know, in here. Here they all are. I don't know if they converge or not. The whole point is we are going to find a convergent subsequence, right? Um, here's the idea. This is an uh, this is sort of a proof by repeatedly bisecting this interval. I said I'm going to use the nested intervals property, which always involves you start with a big closed interval and then sort of chop it down in stages. And that's my my original interval is this, the, just the whole interval, right? So I'll call that I1, which is just the closed interval minus big M to big M, and the proof involves repeatedly bisecting this interval, cutting it in half over and over again. And the rule that I'm going to use to cut it in half, I mean, you divide it like literally in half, right down the middle. So my first division, I suppose, will occur right at zero. And uh, the next interval, like this is I1, the big one. The next one, I2, I have to choose just either the left-hand side or the right-hand side. And how do we decide which side to choose? I'm going to choose intervals so that we always choose a side which contains um, infinitely many terms of the sequence. Infinitely many terms. Of course, the sequence goes on forever. So um, one side or the other has infinitely many of the of the sequence. You know, maybe it converges and it like ends up over here. That means eventually all the terms are on the right side. But maybe it doesn't converge and it's just like it continually bounces back and forth. And in that case, you can choose either side you want. All right. So we we always choose a side. Maybe both sides include infinitely many. In which case, it doesn't matter what you choose. We always choose a side which contains infinitely many terms of the sequence. Okay, so that means um, I1 is the entire thing. Let's just imagine that I2 will be the right-hand side, and it still has terms here, right? There's not, there's not, uh, there's still going to be some on this side, because I chose the side which has infinitely many. You might wonder, um, what if neither side has infinitely many? Well, one or the other has to have infinitely many because there's infinitely many overall. And you can't have like five over here and ten over here, so that adds up to infinitely many. No, if there's infinitely many, there has to be infinitely many on one or the other side, or maybe both sides, in which case it doesn't matter. All right, so that's how I choose I2, and then I divide this in half again, and maybe I'll choose this side this time. I don't know. You always choose a side which has infinitely many points in it. All right, this is I3, etc. Okay? What happens here is we obtain a uh, sequence of nested closed intervals. I'll call them, you know, I, N. And every one of them contains terms from the sequence, right? In fact, they all contain infinitely many terms from the sequence, although that's not as important. So we obtain a sequence of nested closed intervals, I, N, and all contain terms of the sequence. All right. And according to the nested intervals property, these intervals all have a non-empty intersection. In fact, it's not so hard to see. Since you're cutting it in half every time, actually, they, they all sort of boil down to one point. You're going to end up with one point in the intersection of all of them. 
the total intersection of these has no width because it is what you get by dividing the width in half over and over again. You're not going to end up with any um, actual width. But uh, all contain terms of the sequence and there is some number which I'll call say x which is in all of them. Right? So the picture that we end up with is, sorry I'm scrolling here, you have this big one and then you, you cut it in half a bunch of times. But you do it in such a way that you always have points from your sequence are in all of these. Right? And these things, they sort of in the limit, they do actually have a number in them. I don't know if that number was part of the original sequence. It may or may not be. All right. But anyway, I think I can find a subsequence that converges to x of the original uh, red dots, right? I don't know if x itself is one of the red dots, but if I just, for instance, if I choose the smallest one every time, those converge to x, don't they? They, they have to in order for this picture to work out. Uh, in fact, you don't have to choose the smallest one. I'm just going to choose any point. Uh, what did I? My original sequence was called. Sorry, did I call it anything? A n. All right. So uh, I'm going to choose any point. Let's say a n k in i k. This makes a subsequence where each one is in the next interval here. This is a subsequence. Like on the picture here, this would be a n one. This would be a n two. This is a n three, a n four, etc. This is a subsequence which converges to x. And that's the whole. That's the whole thing here. We were supposed to find a subsequence that converges. This is how you do it. By cutting the interval in half every time, making sure that you you uh, keep the half which still has terms from the sequence. All right, that's uh, that's this this proof of the Balzano bar stuff. Watch uh, watch Steve's proof for a uh, for a slightly different argument. Although it's it's similar, he he talks about basically Steve's proof is about the two endpoints of all of these intervals. But you'll you'll see.